Hi everyone, I am Christine and I'm from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I belong to the Emerging Device and System Group and in this presentation I'll be sharing with you one of the works in our lab which is on the complementary two-dimensional MOS2 field effect transistor technology. So we basically develop a technology to fabricate complementary devices for CMOS circuit applications based on two-dimensional materials, particularly using a transition metal dichalcogenide called molybdenum disulfide or MOS2. So let's first talk about two-dimensional materials and why a significant number of studies are geared towards engineering these materials, especially for modern electronic applications. So when we talk about 2D materials, they actually come in different levels of conductivity. It can be semi-metallic like graphene or insulating like hexagonal boron nitride or semiconducting like molybdenum disulfide or tungsten diselenide. But regardless of their form, this material share three common and interesting properties. First of all, when we look into the in-plane atoms, they're actually held together firmly using strong valence bonds. While when we look out of plane or among adjacent layers, there exists a weak Van der Waals force holding the different layers together. This means that it is possible to achieve atomic scale and uniform film thickness by peeling off or exfoliating these layers. So with this, we can layer them together or build heterostructures with specific functionality. And they will form a good interface with each other as the surface of 2D materials can be considered to be pristine or free of dangling bonds. So one of the most promising transition metal dichalcogenides or TMDs in forming the active region of 2D field effect transistors is MOS2. This is because MOS2 is a stable in ambient environment possesses a discrete energy gap, it is ultra thin, therefore it is suitable for flexible and transparent platforms. Its mobility ranges from tens to hundreds of square centimeter per volt second, and there are available substitutional doping methods to achieve both N and P type characteristics. In fact, when we consider modern electronic applications, we see MOS2 based transistors in 3D monolithic integration, flexible and transparent electronics, and in wearable displays. Now, to put some numbers into perspective, here are the thicknesses of different 2D materials in their monolayer form. So we can see here that compared with traditional silicon-based technologies, the carrier mobility of semiconducting 2D materials, including MOS2, is preserved at its ultra-thin or atomically thin channel. So this is why 2D materials are also considered to overcome the scaling limit of traditional transistors. Furthermore, as it is also possible to transfer this materials at low temperature, fabricating active devices at the back end of the line, and building heterostructures made of all 2D materials are greatly augmented. And when it comes to their mechanical flexibility, 2D materials have also been being explored for bendable, curved, or even stretchable displays. Now, with this wide range of applications, definitely we need complementary metal oxide semiconductor or CMOS circuits. So to achieve such circuits on the device level, we need to have both N and P channel devices with similar current drives and on of current ratio higher than 10 to the power 6. And on the circuit level, for example, an inverter is the simplest CMOS circuit that we can actually implement. So um, we actually need a gain larger than unity and a high noise margin. Now, there are different possible integration schemes for these complementary devices. Either we use the same active material to form N and P active areas, or use heterogeneous materials or do pseudo CMOS. But if we want to achieve homogeneous material properties in terms of thermal expansion, mechanical flexibility, and so on, we need both N and P channel devices to be formed using the same active material. So in this work, we will be using MOS2 because of the properties discussed earlier. So now let's talk about what is the problem in meeting the CMOS circuit room requirements. So the thing is, on the device level or in the transistor level, we already have problems that are intertwined together. And what I mean by that is the decisions that we need to make in selecting the source rain metal contacts to the 2D semiconductor, its dielectric environment, 
the gate electrode, and the processing conditions into which we incorporate these materials together need to be carefully designed. And the most critical design consideration is on the source drain electrode, because typically there exists a high Schottky barrier height between the 3D metal and the 2D semiconductor junction, which introduces a high contact resistance, and therefore it inhibits the injection of carriers from the source to the channel. Therefore, the output current drive usually suffers. And what's more, MOS2-based transistors are N-type in nature. So to understand the output current drive degradation and why is it easy, is it it is easier to achieve N-type characteristics rather than the P-type characteristics, we need to look further into what's happening at the 2D semiconductor and metal interface. So in the ideal scenario, we expect that according to the Schottky theory, the barrier height between the metal and the semiconductor should be a function of their work function difference alone. That means that if I have an undoped MOS2 and we use a low work function metal such as scandium or titanium, we will be able to achieve an N-channel device. And following this analysis, if we use a high work function metal such as nickel or platinum, then we will be able to achieve P-channel devices. But the thing is, the Schottky theory seldom holds experimentally, and it is difficult to it, and it is a difficult task to tune the barrier height. And in actual, because of the interactions between the metal and MOS2, the metal Fermi level typically alights in a location near the conduction band edge of MOS2. That is why, regardless of the metal work function, we get an N-channel device. And this is what we consider as the Fermi level pinning effect. So the Fermi level the Fermi level pinning effect originates from the metal and MOS2 interactions. That is, in the event that the metal is evaporated or sputtered, it can either be weakly or strongly absorbed, which can then form small or large interface states that influence the extent into which the metal Fermi level is going to be thin. Furthermore, there are intrinsic structural defects in MOS2 in the form of sulfur vacancies that control where the charge neutrality is, and therefore these vacancies also affect where the metal Fermi level is going to be thin. So how serious is this Fermi pinning effect? So not only do we expect that there will be a high contact resistance, but when we look into existing implementations of MOS2-based N and P channel devices, there is a significant difference in their output current drives. In fact, the current drive of existing P channel devices lags by one to three orders of magnitude, which is definitely going to be an issue with the relative transistor with sizing, especially because we want to achieve similar output current for the CMOS circuit implementation, which leads us to the question, is there anything we can do so that the metal will be weakly absorbed and the localized states from sulfur vacancies be passivated by adjusting the processing conditions? And with this, we'll look into two important aspects in the fabrication process. One is the chamber-based pressure and the deposition rate of the metal, and another is the odoplasma treatment for passivating sulfur vacancies on the, on the underlying MOS2 film before the metal deposition. So recently, our group has already demonstrated a high current drive P channel P channel device based on NB dope MOS2. So by using NB doping, we believe that the Fermi pinning effect can be reduced. By using slow evaporation of platinum at a high vacuum pressure, we were able to show a reduction in the shot key barrier height and contact resistance, which leads to the increase in the output current, all because of the improved interface quality between platinum and MOS2. So now that we know that we can improve the interface quality this way, we want to further enhance the performance of the P-channel device by passivating the sulfur vacancies on the underlying MOS2 film. This is so that we can match its performance with its N-channel counterpart. So take note that our goal is not only to improve the P-channel device, but we have to ensure that the performance of the N-channel device is not sacrificed by using platinum as the source drain electrode. So with this, we first fabricated test structures using a global backgate and top source drain contact configuration. So to achieve an N and P type characteristics, we exfoliated undope and and NB dope MOS2 respectively onto a onto a 30 nanometer aluminum oxide acting as the gate dielectric. So after exfoliating, 
we optically identified films with thicknesses ranging from 5 to 8 nanometer. And using e-beam lithography, we patterned multiple contact metals following the transfer length method or TLM method to later characterize the contact resistance. And we also perform and we also perform DSCUM and auto passivation only for the P channel device, then slowly evaporate platinum. So let's first examine the effect of autoplasma treatment in the PFET test structures. So we can see here that it is evident that the current drive improves by introducing a 50 watt autoplasma for 40 seconds. So we also characterize the contact resistance using the transfer length method. So as shown conceptually here in the top right figure, because of because of the auto passivation, we can clearly observe the reduction in the contact resistance. Take note that the contact resistance is also a function of the gate voltage because of the global back gate configuration, wherein there is an overlap between the gate and the source rain electrodes. So the enhanced current drive can be also explained by the improved carrier injection between the source and the 2D channel junction brought about by the reduction in the Schottky barrier height for holes. So the barrier height for, for holes can be extracted using the given equation here for ID. And it is defined as the point where the effective barrier, phi b, uh, starts to deviate away from its linear relationship with the drain current. So with the autoplasma treatment, we were able to reduce the barrier height for holes to merely 60 milli electron volt. So when we look into the performance of the NPET test device, so we are still able to achieve a good transfer and output characteristics despite using a high work function metal such as platinum as its source drain contact. So in some sense, we can say that the Fermi pinning effect benefits the NPET implementation. So now that we are able to improve the current drive of the PFET without compromising the performance of the NFET, we then integrated the complementary devices together using a technique called deterministic dry transfer method. So we first exfoliated undope and NB-dope MOS2 films on separate temporary substrate. So using PVA as the transfer media, we pick up these films one by one and deterministically press each film side by side onto a 30 nanometer aluminum oxide on silicon substrate. So the process is carried out at a relatively low temperature, around 65 degrees Celsius, to reduce the organic contaminations from the transfer media. So the water-soluble PVA is then dissolved in DI water, and the sample is annealed in N2H2 ambient for one hour. The, the source drain contacts of the PFET is firstly defined using e-beam lithography, cleaned using RF autoplasma discum, and then followed by a 40-second autopassivation. So the source ring contacts of the NFET is defined using the same manner, except for the autopassivation part. So platinum is then evaporated slowly to act both as an electrode to the complementary devices, as well as the metallization for the CMOS inverter connection. So Looking into the transfer characteristics of the complementary devices, so we can see here that the threshold voltage of the NFET is extracted to be around minus one volt, while that for the PFET is around minus two volts. So high out of current ratio greater than 10 to the power six is also observed. As for the output characteristics, at an overdrive voltage of plus minus four volts, the drain current reaches up to 50 microampere per micrometer for both devices. So as we are able to match the current drive of the complementary devices, we are able to obtain a steep voltage transition spanning almost the entire supply voltage as shown here in the measured, vo in the measured voltage transfer curves. As such, a gain of 20 and a noise margin of 85% at a three volt supply are also achieved. So as a conclusion, we have demonstrated the feasibility of fabricating complementary MOS to FETs with similar current drives. So we were also able to identify key design considerations and processing conditions. And this include the choice of source drain electrodes, metal evaporation, and passivation of sulfur vacancies. We have also into integrated a CMOS inverter circuit with rail-to-rail -rail performance, high gain, and wide noise margin. So in the end, our proposed technology exhibits the potential of enhancing the performance of 2D CMOS circuits for modern electronic applications. So these are the references cited in this work. And thank you very much for listening.